of angry parents whose children attend the University of Ghana Basic School besiege the entrance of the school, accusing Vice Chancellor of the University of Acts of Lawlessness after they were prevented from entering it. Financial leakages in the public sector set to cost Ghana some 1.2 billion Ghana cities annually. Those are our headlines for the hour news today with me, Kemini Nyamani Amano. Details coming up, don't go away. Watching news today. Dozens of parents of was at the University of Ghana Basic School Monday morning besieged one of the gates of the University of Ghana, leading to a chamota demanding assurances from authorities over the safety of the awards. According to the parents, they were asked to drop their children at the gate to be conveyed by a bus to the school because they did not have a ticket to access the university's routes. My colleague Matilda Vomaga spoke with some parents. What exactly has been the frustration? Um, you know, I was here about 6.20 to drop my kids so I could get to the office before 8 a.m. And uh, when we got here, they said we have to uh, have stickers on our vehicles before we will be allowed to pass. A number of vehicles had been parked around the area and because of that we could not even have access. And when we parked, and how to get the children to walk about uh, 150 meters to join a bus exactly. uh, to get to the compound. And you know the genesis of this. St started from the uh, university constructing the road and then asking to take toll, exactly. and which we all raised some kind of issues about it. Even some people had to take it to the law courts you know, for interpretation, whether somebody can just start taking toll, which is a tax. Okay. Tell us, you, you the, are a member the, of the, the PTA. The How, what have you done about it? The last PTA, mm -hmm. the issue came up. Even before the, the, the toll, the issue came up. And we said that we, those who just come to drop our children mm -hmm. and then have to continue to work and have them picked, what is the option? Mm -hmm. And all the university people could, authorities could tell us was that we have to pay the toll. And we said, if the children are part of the community mm -hmm. and you are asking us to pay toll, that is unfair. And look at the amount involved. Mm -hmm. This sticker issue, you know, the government asked them to stop the toll yeah. so that the government will pay, you know, for the cost of the loan or whatever they used to do it. The next day, there was a banner that then you have to get a sticker. We went there, asked for how much it costs. They said it's 400 Ghana per year per vehicle. Exactly. And we said this is... Yours. No, I wouldn't. Because the government has asked them not to take anything. Mm -hmm. And they should not repackage it into the sticker. Exactly. Tell us, how did you manage this morning? How did you manage to get your ward into the school? The, the children were dropped right here, if you can see. The vehicles are all packed. And they were made to walk. My, fa my kid, five years, seven years, they walked 150 kilometers and joined the bus. Mm -hmm. Now the parents around are saying that they don't know the option mm -hmm. available when they close. Mm -hmm. Until the investing authorities tell them, can you move in and pick your child? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the big question now. Okay. Are the children going to be brought by the bus to that place mm -hmm. so that we go and pick them home? Exactly. Or how are the children supposed to be returned? Next line of action for parents. We are questioning mm -hmm. the wisdom behind the decision that everybody should go through one entrance. Mm -hmm. So why, why is this entrance blocked? Mm -hmm. Why is the one going, for, uh, the one from Agboba? Why is it blocked? Exactly. And you see, apart from we parents bringing the toddlers to school, 
the students, majority of them, live in this area. Exactly. And now if you ask them to go through a vehicle, should take them through that distance before there, are they, able to, are they going to be able to pay for it? Exactly. My concern is, it's not even about whether my kid was able to go to school or whether my wife was able to go to work. Exactly. My question right here is, this chancellor is violating the Commerce Clause, mm -hmm. which is freedom of movement, freedom of vehicles, freedom of everything. But if this person is, he keeps violating our freedom of movement, I think the education ministry... I've been joined by Matilda Omega over the telephone. Uh, she'll bring us up to speed what's happened. Hello, Matilda. Hello, Kimmy. What's the latest on this? You know, after so much agitation by these parents who were refused entry to the campus early on, uh, they were allowed in. We don't know who exactly gave that directive. But then we've also been speaking to the deputy chairman of the PTA, who tells us that there's going to be an emergency meeting with the University of Ghana authorities to find a way to address this. So uh, we'll be rolling that for you in a okay, moment right. for you to listen. Uh, let's take a listen then. All right. Right, and so Matoga Womaga engaged the PTA chairman, the vice chairman of the PTA at the University of Ghana Basic School. She tells us that indeed uh, the parents were allowed after all. Let's take a listen to that interview. So he is taking it up and uh, he assured us that he's going to take it, take it up. He's already met with the registrar and he's going to meet with uh, either the VC or the school, the university, university board chair. That's the assurance he gave us. Come again. Well, we are giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're dealing with human beings, level-headed beings, and we want to trust them for their word. So we are just giving them the benefit of the doubt. So what did they say they are going to do? Well, it's a dialogue. So they need to, we have sent our proposals and our position. So they are just going to meet with the authorities and dialogue, articulate our positions, and then we'll pick it up from there. What exactly has been your proposition to them? Our position is that we need to be granted legitimacy of that recognition, that we are also members of the university community. Because the basic school does not belong to any private individual. It belongs to the university. And we don't come here for fun. We come here because of our children. So if we are coming because of our children, then they must give us that right and that access. And that's the reason why we come. Thank you so much. But whatever comes, we're going to get back to you people. God bless you. Uh, Matilda, have we heard anything from the university authority? Uh, we haven't heard anything from them. I've been trying to reach the PRS Salama and then she has not been answering her phone. But then I understand that uh, there's going to be an emergency meeting. So we are still hanging on to see if we could just get some information as to regards to how best they're going to address the situation. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll bring more on this in subsequent broadcasts. Let's move on to something else. And former Ashanti Regional Police Commander Zergen Ghanaians not uh, to let their political difference stop them uh, from providing financial assistance to the poor society. For him, the link between poverty and crime is clear and perhaps the latter would reduce if more people fulfill God's expectation from his followers to show love to the needy. He spoke to join Yusuf Mahmoud Mohammed Nuruddin in an exclusive interview. This UP Janin says poor Ghanaians are usually those that fall into wrong hands and consequently become criminals to terrorize innocent people. He calls for support to the poor to realize the potential, adding that if Ghanaians rely on God's words without practicing it, it will be difficult to get solutions to problems. After two years as regional commander, DCOP Jenin is most proud of his work during the 2012 general elections. Because I came at a time politics was at its peak. Because I stayed in the middle and make sure I behave like a professional. He expressed worry at attempt to paint professional work with political colors. 
people did not see me align myself with the party. So they started saying all sorts of things. But as a policeman, as a professional policeman, that was what was expected of me. So if somebody thinks otherwise, fair enough. He maintains there were many challenges. The former regional police commander outlined some of his achievements heading the police in the Ashanti region. Within two years, I put 43 armed robbers behind bars. Within the two years, 24 of them died in a shootout. Within the two years, 18 of the armed robbers are still on fire. And within the two years, I've been able to make a shanty regime come. I think it is enough. That was what I was brought here to do. And I did just that. And I thank God for that. DCOP Augustine Jenin is heading for the National Police Headquarters to take charge of police patrols. Mahmoud Mohamed Noudin's report for Joy News. An outbreak of cerebrospinal meningitis has been reported in four districts in the northern region, leaving a person dead. 30 cases have been reported so far out of the number. 23 were reported from Yendi, two from the Mion district, while one came from the Zabzugo district, and two more from the Saboba districts. We're joined over the telephone by Benicia Abong, uh, Yendi Municipal Health Director. Thank you very much for joining us, Benicia. I think we have lost Benicia. We'll uh, bring Benicia back and discuss CSM outbreak in the northern region. Move on to something else in the... Uh, well, move on to the old Ishiaya and a junior school. High school risks being shut down as parents continue to withdraw the awards from the school due to its poor infrastructure. Pupils as well as authorities of the school say the lack of proper infrastructure is hampering effective teaching and learning. Haruna Yusuf Wumpone, a small. The old Israya M.A. Junior High School was established in the early 1970s with a student population of about 100. The school, which is located some 10 minutes drive from the eastern regional capital, Kufuridia, has not undergone any renovation since it was established. Interestingly, the school's population has been on the decline over the years. There are just 67 children currently in the school as parents continue to withdraw their awards due to the poor infrastructure under which the children learn. Some residents in the area have, however, converted the classrooms into a place of convenience. Headmaster of the school, Robert Kwashi, tells Joy News the school has vast lands which can be developed for use by the school. He adds that the absence of a staff common room means teachers have to sit under trees to prepare their lesson notes. This snake fell from the shed down, but luckily enough, it did not fall inside the classroom. It fell outside, so the children and the teachers have to rush out. Under this big tree is our staff common room. Teachers sit over here under the mercy of the weather to write their notes and do everything over here. So, uh, in fact, it has been very, very tedious working under this condition. Pupils are forced to close early whenever it rains, as the roofs are filled with holes. The headmaster thus appealed to government and other NGOs to come to their aid and provide them with decent classroom blocks. Anil Abi and Enoch Edu, JHS3 pupils of the school, also made an appeal to government. Look at our school building. We want the government to help us. And when it's shining, we feel very hot. That does not encourage us in our academic way. And it does not encourage us to learn hard. So please, when it's, when it's raining, we just pack our books and go home. So and we are facing a lot of challenges, such as when we are in the class, some reptiles just enter the class and learn with us. And when it is about to rain, we just run at the master's office. And that one is not helping the master, the master's academic work. So we, we want the government.
government or any NGO to help the school. The assemblyman for the old Isuaya electoral area, Evans Tete, also spoke to Joy News. I myself completed school here around the mid-90s, and we were under shed. But since then, government came, government has gone by. They always say they will eliminate schools under trees. Fortunately for us, we are by main roadside. But all these benefits have eluded us. So it is our plea now that the government will hear our cry so that whatever could be done about it, so that we too, we have a taste of the better Ghana agenda. Let's go back to northern Ghana where we understand there's an outbreak of a cerebrospinal meningitis. We are joined over the telephone by Benicia Abon, Yendi Municipal Health Director. Thank you very much for joining us, Benicia. Thank you. What must people know about the CSM? Pardon me. What must people in northern Ghana at the moment know about the CSM? I think uh, it's a, a yearly affair, so a lot of people are aware of CSM. What is CSM? Cerebral spinal meningitis. What's it's the inflammation of the coverage of the brain and the okay. spinal cord. I see. Yes. I see. I see. How does one get uh, this disease? You can get it by breathing in the organism. It's airborne. That is its mode of spread. I, I, I see. And, and if it's airborne, it means that uh, everybody in Yendi, for instance, where you mm -hmm. municipal health director, we understand 23 cases have been re recorded. For, 42 cases, rather, have, have been yes. recorded. Uh, as at now. As at now. Uh, yes. it, it means that it's, it's really widespread. How can people prevent infection? In fact, I, uh, I want to correct something. It is not widespread because uh, as we are talking, only three people are on admission. The rest have been treated and discharged. They are just sporadic cases. Okay, let me put it this way. It's mm -hmm. airborne, which means that you can easily contract yeah. the illness. Yes. How do I prevent myself from getting it? Uh, the only way by preventing it is, first of all, the primary prevention would be immunization against the disease. C then come again, I'm not sure I got that. I said, first of all, we normally give immunization to protect one against the disease. And we did a mass one in 2012. But it doesn't mean that everybody can get protected. You know, some people will be left out here and there. So what you can do is when you start seeing, I mean, feeling headache, fever, and neck pain, the best thing is to go to the facility first. Mm. And they respond to treatment easily. That is why so far only one died because that fellow came in. Then secondly, we have to avoid overcrowding mm. because if you don't know who may be incubating or having the organism in him. So that if the fellow breathes, at least if there's good ventilation, the organism cannot get concentrated in the, lo the location for one to get to, for it to spread. So this is what we are actually sensitizing people to do. Avoid overcrowding. Sleep in well-ventilated places. The weather is already too hot here. So you sleep in open spaces. And then when you realize that you are headache and fever, please report immediately. So don't take things for granted that, oh, it may be malaria. Let me go and buy anti-malaria in the chemical shop and take so this is what is going on. And the management of the cases so far is good because all of the people that have been admitted, except the first one, they've all recovered and discharged, except the three that came uh, yesterday. Mm. And, and, and why couldn't they also go home? They just came. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the person who died. The one who died reported very late. Well... Yes, very well, by the, the couldn't help. Right. I mean, she couldn't be helped. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Benicia. Benicia Abon is the ND Municipal Health Director. We'll move on to something else. The Parliamentary Select Committee on Roads and Highways is storing the ferry sites which has been designated to convey passengers and vehicles across the Volta River after the closure of the Adome Bridge. Members of Parliament last week expressed concern over the hardship brought about by the closure of the bridge. The MP said alternative routes 
uh, routes had not been rehabilitated, while one of the ferries which had been secured to carry humans and vehicles across the Volta River was not in good condition, hence broke down frequently. Don News' parliamentary correspondent Emmanuel Ante is with the members of parliament who tour in the site. He's joined us over the telephone. Hello, Ima. Hello, Kamini. Mm. Tell us what's been going on. Well, we got here about 10 minutes ago, and uh, with uh, the minister, chairman of the, of the committee, uh, and, the, and the other members of the committee have been briefed on the situation on the ground. According to them, according to the managers of the ferry, they are saying that uh, they only had a challenge. At the beginning, the very first day of the ferry, of the ferry, the working of the ferry. But uh, from then on, they have uh, really managed the situation and they have uh, sorted out everything. Now, the major problem here now is uh, the patronage of the ferry. The, the reason is that this, the commuters are saying that the amount being charged is too much. Um, a bigger truck is paying uh, 30 Ghana cities while the saloon cars are paying 10 cities, and then the, the trotters are also paying uh, uh, 15 Ghana cities. And this has created a lot of problems for uh, commuters. And so because of that, the traffic here is very, very low. People are not patronizing uh, the, the, the ferry because they think it's too, too much, too expensive. And another problem here too is that those who are making small, small businesses here, those uh, sell, uh, um, food vendors and other people who are making uh, their businesses here, are also complaining bitterly because they said, there are no more uh, uh, um, customers to serve them uh, or for them to serve them to get their, their money back. So this, this is uh, what has been going on here, Kevin. I see. Uh, have the, uh, has the committee made any remark uh, concerning what they have observed or what it has observed? Uh, not yet. Um, we are yet to see them. Uh, now they are being based on uh, the situation on the ground, what is happening. But some members are also asking questions as to the amount being charged. They are also in the view of, uh, they, they are in, in support of the people who are saying that it is too expensive. They also call for a reduction of the, of the uh, fares. What, yeah, what they are saying is that they need to sit down and then readjust the fares, readjust uh, the fares, so that many people will be able to join the ferry. It's, it's, it's a huge problem here, uh, Kamini. The fair issue is a major problem, and all the members are also complaining about the same issue, uh, Kennedy. I see. So the, the, those who are doing the brief, what sort of questions uh, has the committee asked, uh, asked them so far? Come again, Kennedy. So what sort of questions has the committee been asking since the briefing? Yeah. The, the question they've been asking is uh, how much uh, fuel the, the, the ferry consumes. What went into deciding or uh, 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 um, uh, calculating the fares for mm -hmm. each vehicle that is supposed to port? And, and the answers that they have given, most, all the questions are based on the, the calculation of the fares. And their answers have been that uh, the engine of the ferry consumes a lot of fuel. They have four engines, two of them to, to um, uh, propel the, the, the ferry to the destination, and then the two other engines for electricity and to provide electricity onto the ferry. And so each engine, each of the engines, each of the engines consumes about six gallons of uh, diesel in one, one journey from uh, one point to the other consumes about six gallons. So the in and out is uh, 12 gallons. And so that is what went into their uh, calculation into I the, the fare. I see. So that's what's been happening. Uh, t tell us what you've observed about places of convenience uh, around the uh, ferry point. Well, the, the place is still under construction, but they have uh, made provisions for uh, 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 those uh, market people, those who are uh, doing their best business around. But as to uh, the rest places and uh, places of convenience, uh, we are yet to see. Uh, probably in the next few minutes, we'll be taken to the place to really observe what exactly the situation is. But at the moment, we cannot see any place of convenience. From what I have seen, I have not seen any place of convenience that if anybody wants to visit uh, uh, nature, nature's hall, I mean, there's nothing of a sort. I, mean, I, I, I see. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that there's very low traffic 
at the uh, at the, the ferry point because uh, of the fares, and people are resorting to alternate routes to get to their destination. We yeah. also got information that indeed, in fact, uh, this committee had recognized that there had been reports that the alternate routes had also not been completed. Uh, and, and so what response have they received as to the alternate routes and, and, and its finishing up? Uh, can, I, I, please, uh, can you come again here? The, the reception is a bit bad here, so if you can repeat yourself again. The line very well, very well. I'm, I'm asking about the alternate routes that were not uh, completed before the visit to, to the, the ferry point today. Oh, oh okay. Um, what they are saying, what they, what they are saying is that they are hoping that these ones, these uh, the, the ferries would rather serve those purposes. Um, the member, one of the members asked uh, whether those alternative routes uh, that were not completed uh, have have been completed now. And the response that we we got from uh, the, one of the engineers is that uh, they are almost complete. But yes, uh, they they believe that this uh, ferry uh, are supposed to do the job that the other uh, alternative uh, are supposed to do, and so they, 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 they are working on it, but they are not yet done, and so they, this is how the situation is, looks like at this Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel Antes joining us as parliamentary correspondent to bring you more in subsequent broadcasts. Now, authorities at the Jukwa Senior High School in the Central Region say inadequate classrooms are hampering effective teaching and learning in the school currently. Six classes are accommodated in three classrooms. Established in 1991, Jukwa Senior High School has a population of over a thousand students. The school, which has enjoyed massive achievements in both regional and national competitions, is now facing serious infrastructural challenges. Currently, six classes are accommodated in three classrooms. The situation, according to the headmaster of the school, Ernest Noye, calls for serious help from government and the general public to help tackle the deficit to enable teachers and learning go on successfully. The district chief executive for Herman Lua Dintra, Francis Kranchisichi, who handed over a new classroom block to help the school tackle the challenge, assured the school of more interventions but asked them to put the new block into good use. Richard Kodinyako's report from the Central Region. There's more news ahead. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying on news today. Let's do some business. Financial leakages in the public sector, which costs the economy between 1.2, 1 to 2 billion Ghana cities annually, according to an economist and international consultant, Professor Kletus Dodunu. The leakages must be sealed if Ghana is to minimize AIDS dependency and excessive government borrowing. Finance Minister Satekba disclosed weeks ago donors have withheld direct budgetary support worth $700 million. Uh, in the past two years. The donor's action was in response to government's large budget overruns in 2012 and 2013. The inability of some ministries to meet conditions for disbursement of these grants. The situation has increased pressure on the government's domestic revenues. Professor Dojinu believes Ghana's over reliance on aid and a ballooning budget deficits can be kept if measures are taken to limit financial hemorrhage in the public sector. Vodafone has agreed to buy Spanish cable operator Ono for 7.2 billion euros in deal aimed at expanding its interest in Europe. Ono, which is private equity owned, offers cable TV and internet services and has 1.9 million customers in Spain. Vodafone boss Vittorio Colaio said the deal was an attractive value creation opportunity. The deal comes just six months after Vodafone bought a controlling stake in German cable operator Cabell 
before the Vodafone, before the Vodafone deal, Ono's private equity owners had been planning to float the company on the Madrid Stock Exchange. Baba Tando brings us sports settings. Good afternoon. My name is Baba Tando. Time now to get into the world of sports. And uh, we begin with the Black Maidens who got off to a winning start as they defeated Korea DPR 2 0 in the Group B opener in the ongoing FIFA Under 17 Women's World Cup in Costa Rica on Saturday. Now, a Jane IEM first half goal and a second half, uh, and a second after the break by Sandra Ousuan Sassil's victory in Liberia as Augustine Aduti's side jumped to the summit of the 14 table. Now, the win was a perfect start for Aduti, whose team returned to action to Tomorrow against Germany at the Estadio Edgardo, um, that's at the Baltodano Stadium. The dancing on the dugouts, but it was poor defending again from the Koreans. Excellent work by Lali Osaka and a lovely finish into the bottom corner. Knew the challenge was coming from Ri Hui Yong, but managed to get the ball away in time. And Jane Ayam, who plays for Ashtan Ladies in Ghana. Gets the opening goal of the tournament. And Uisu Ansa gratefully accepted the gift. What on earth was the defender doing? It was clear the goalkeeper wasn't going to come. And a simpler goal will not be scored, you would feel, at these finals. Ghana lead by two goals to nil. What a disaster for the North Koreans. Right, Ghana's cabinet has approved over 24.6 million Ghana cities as a total budget for the Black Stars as they compete in the 2014 World Cup festivities to be held in Brazil this June. Now, this was contained in a press release signed by Minister for Information and Media Relations, Mahama Ayariga. A breakdown of the total amount indicates that for the first group stage of the competition, Cabinet has approved the release of 10,500 Ghana CDs uh, to the Ghana Football Association to finance Ghana's participation. For subsequent stages of the competition, a further amount of 14,177 uh, CDs has also been budgeted to cover the team's expenses if they qualify. Now, this brings government's commitment to the Black Stars' participation to a total of 24,677,025 pesos. And I have been joined on phone, special assistant, to the um, sports minister, Elvis Ifi Ankara. And I'm talking about Yao Mpof Ankara. Hello, Yao. Good afternoon. Hi, good um, afternoon, Rashida. Yeah, today looks like we're all playing the numbers games. Uh, if you listen around to all radio stations, to TV stations, uh, you read on the internet, it's just numbers, numbers, numbers. Now, what really is the amount that has been approved by cabinet? <laughs> well, you've, you've said it. I mean, you actually said um, uh, thousands, which is, <laughs> I'm sure it's just a slip. It, it's millions, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I, I did hear you say thousands. But at the end of the day, the figures that were out there quite clearly were, were not accurate. And that is why I think the GFA and the ministry did ask or at least appeal for caution and patience. Mm. And now that it's out, people can now address issues and look at figures uh, instead of, you know, the speculation. So quite clearly, this is the amount that is, this is the amount rather, that has been approved for uh, the Black Stars World Cup budget. So what, is it $9.4 million? Uh, that's about 24.6 million CDs? Well, that is exactly what the statement says, yes, from cabinet. That is what has been approved by cabinet and that is the amount we're now dealing with i think people are disappointed because their their, their speculations were way 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 off and uh, they they still want to somehow justify it by saying that is this budget not too small this is what has been approved and i think we should commend you know um, government for acting so swiftly for the fa for taking their time to prepare it the ministry for going through it and the processes have been followed and I think nobody can have any complaints uh, to the fact that this is what has been approved following 
a lot of scrutiny. This is not the first time Ghana is going to the World Cup. And if we're still being as stringent and as tough on budgets as we, we've always been, I think it's a very good sign. Sure, Yao. Okay, so what really is the amount that the GFA presented to government as budget for the World Cup before it was uh, actually brought down to $9.4 million? How much did the GFA submit to government? But I'm not sure any budget has been brought down. I'm not too sure where that's coming from. Okay, I mean, Yao. Okay, but the issue here is that I don't know how much exactly the GFA presented to government as budget. So now we know that it's $9.4 million. Yes, hooray. But then how much did the GFA submit to government? <laughs> I see that. I think what you're, you're, you're asking me is to, again, to speculate. Look, the bottom no, line is... Yao. For crying out loud, you are special assistant to the sports minister, and so I'm thinking that you shouldn't be meticulous with um, issues like this. So, I mean, very, how much very, really did very, the very GFA present? It's absolutely meticulous. And what I'm saying is that the amount you've quoted is what has been approved by a cabinet. That's I understand, line. but what I want to know is how much the GFA presented to cabinet as budget. This is what the GFA has presented, and it's been given approval. How much? The amount you've just quoted. Uh, Yao, <laughs> Yao, I mean, monitoring, monitoring media, um, media platforms from the, for, uh, for a couple of weeks now. I mean, you see $20, $20 million, uh, you see $22 million, you see $24 million as budget submitted to government for approval by the GFA. I am not sure which exactly is the figure. So, I mean, is it, is it too much to ask to want to know how much exactly the GFA submitted to government? No, I don't think it's too much. But there were so scenarios. So then how much is it? No, there are, there are scenarios. For example, without deviating and also confusing our, our dear listeners, there are scenarios. For example, let me give you one scenario. If you're talking about winning bonuses, you're talking about appearance fees, you're talking about preparations up to the tournament, during the tournament, up to the first round, the group stages, there are scenarios. That was presented by the GFA. I am not the person to be explaining that scenario because it's a budget they have meticulously worked with. So if the scenarios are compared and after scenario A, scenario B or scenario C, the cabinet approves this amount, I think the satisfactory thing to do is to welcome that and agree that this is the best budget that can work for the Black Stars. For clearly, the World Cup clearly, you do not want to answer my question, but I'll move I on. I think to, I've answered I'll your move on to a, I'll move on to another question <laughs> and ask: uh, How much is each player taking as appearance fee? How much is each player taking as winning bonus in the group stage? Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, I'm surprised you do not know this. I specialize well, I don't the want Minister to lie. of Youth and Sport. <laughs> well, I don't want to lie because between you and I, the GFA is still working with the players to come to an agreement. And but, I think yeah, if, if they haven't come to a common consensus, I'm not sure that the $9.4 million will just have been accepted and everything quietened down. Exactly what I'm saying is that we have scenarios. And I think in our haste for news and information, we want to hear things to make our listeners and our viewers happy, but that won't happen simply because exactly, yeah, we're but there have been background discussions. There have been there have been prior discussions. There have been meetings. I know meetings have taken place ever since um, the delegation that went to inspect facilities in Brazil came back. There have been series of um, talks here and there. And so, Yao, I mean, it will be very surprising to say that um, you do not know certain things. Of course, I don't expect that you know or you, are, you, you have every information on hand, but at least there are certain details uh, with, uh, with figures that I expect that should be at your disposal. Bonuses okay. for the players is not something that is uh, for public consumption now. Just okay. as the speculation of 20 million was false, we've got to be careful to deal with facts and numbers. And I think at the right time, the FA would announce that, and I think we can discuss it when it's confirmed. Okay. Yao Pofuankwa is special assistant to the Minister of Youth and Sports, Elvis Efriyankwa. Yao, thanks for your time. Now we go over, we're still on phone, but this time we talk to spokesperson of the Ghana Football Association, Ibrahim Sani Dara. Sani, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Sani, today we are playing the numbers games. Uh, the numbers game, actually. Um, the budget, we are told, is $9.4 million. True? Well, that is... Um we speak CD style, right? Okay, so what's the CD? What's the CD equivalent? Um, 
the city equivalent is what we also in the press statement sent from the from cabinet today and it's about 24 um, and much more close to 25 million dollars okay so what goes into this budget well um just like you we've not had the official breakdown of what goes into the budget so i wouldn't be able to say that this is great or that is great it's, um uh, a proposal we sent to government, it was up to government to decide an upward adjustment or uh, a downward adjustment. So uh, we are yet to get that explanation of it. But um, I'm confident that what has been sent or what has been approved will suffice the Black Stars to excel in the tournament and uh, to, to, to help the country gain more level of football. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank um, President John Dramani Mahama for his decisive action on the budget, sensitive to what economic conditions the country are, the country is facing. Yeah, okay. Sunny, now let's move away from your confidence uh, in what has been done so far. Um, I'm sure that the GFA submitted an itemized budget to government. Yes. You submitted an itemized budget to the government. Okay. Yes. So how much exactly did you submit to government as your budget initially? Absolutely not meant for public consumption. That's all right. But what went into your initial budget? What goes into the... It's, it's a normal thing. Your accommodation, your preparation matches, your, your food, your bonuses, and stuff like that. They all go into the budget. Okay. So now that this... Uh, uh, 24, almost 25 million Ghana cities has been approved. It means that at least we have an idea how much each player is taking as winning bonus in the group stage? I'm not certain. As I told you, I've not had the breakdown. You would have a proposal of, let's say, a figure for a particular item to be set. But possibly government might say, maybe let me adjust it downwardly or let me adjust it upwardly. So I wouldn't be able to say at the moment. We only received a statement that says that this amount has been approved. Okay. If I say this, anything, I would only be rumor mongering. Okay. So how about how much each player is taking on as appearance fee? I don't know about that. I wouldn't be able to tell. Thank you very much, Ibrahim Sanidara. He is a spokesperson of the Ghana Football Association. We move on to other issues and Liverpool on Sunday beat Manchester United 3-0 at the Old Trafford. Gerrard scored two penalties and could even afford to miss a third before Luis Suarez rounded off the scoring. And Arsenal on Sunday beat Tottenham Hotspur 1-0 thanks to Thomas Rosicki uh, who scored an early goal just minutes into the game. Now the win means Arsenal are third in the standings. Just four points of leaders Chelsea who lost 1-0 to Aston Villa on Saturday. So Carvel Sports is done on News Today. My name is Baba Tando. Thank you very much for staying on News Today. Just before we deal with news from elsewhere, you recall that last week the motorway was uh, temporarily closed for uh, some repair works on uh, a bridge on the motor. We understand a diversion has been created and is to be open today to ease traffic on the motorway. My colleague Adley Das is there and she's joined us over the telephone. Hello, Adley. Hello, Adley. Hello, Kamini. Has the diversion been opened? No, the diversion has not been opened, but I understand it's completed. Uh, I'm constructing it, but then they blocked it with this plastic wood block. But at the moment, um, the supervisors are not here to tell me why they've not opened the diversion to traffic. So uh, um, 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 those moving to Accra on the Accra bound lane, they are so using the left lane while the um, right lane has been blocked. Um, because actually what the diversion is supposed to do is to allow uh, um, those coming to Accra to enter into the summer bound lanes on the speed lane, and then when they move across uh, uh, um, beyond the uh, um, the bridge, the broken bridge, they can just enter back onto the main road. But now, though the construction is finished, though they uh, um, they are done with the diversion, it hasn't been opening to traffic yet. 
Um, but what I'm also picking up is that um, we are actually looking at other ways to create another diversion on the right side. I, I don't know how that's going to uh, um, happen, but then because the supervisors are not here, I've not been able to ask them how that's going to happen. Right, we'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much, Adley. So there'll be more on this in subsequent broadcast. Now, we understand also that the energy minister has been dispatched to uh, Nigeria to try, he used to engage in talks on the opening of the West African gas pipeline. Let's take a listen. But one of the major uh, areas we started facing challenges again is in the energy uh, sector. The last time we were here, the West African gas pipeline was disrupted. It was cut. And so we're not getting any gas supplies from Nigeria. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this year we have the same problem. The pipeline is not broken. But the volumes that Nigeria is piping through the, uh, pi the pipeline have dropped to almost zero. And so Asogli is down. Asogli produces 220 megawatts of our generation. And then we have what we call the Mines Reserve Plant that produces another 50 megawatts of our generation. So 220 plus 50 is 270. So suddenly we have a drop of 270 megawatts in our power generation. And that is what has led to this emergency uh, load uh, management. I'm dispatching the Minister of Energy to Nigeria today to meet with the West African Gas Pipeline authorities and uh, try to resolve uh, this issue. So President Mahama was addressing an executive meeting with a clergy at the Flagstaff House. Shobas, quick question. Are you one of those many Ghanaians or Africans whose parents think that you're perhaps engaged in exactly what they would call a career? Well, you're not alone. One of Nigeria's biggest sell and artists, the branch, has recently disclosed that his father is still not convinced he is in the right profession, in spite of the million, millions of records he has sold. That is just one of the songs that made Jibanj a global sensation. He has sold over 11 million albums, and well, if your math is good, you can calculate how much that translates into in monetary terms. Yet, Jibanj says his father is concerned about what he calls a career. He said in a recent interview, his father told him not to do music, and even now, his father still asks, are you sure this music thing is right for you? But the 33-year-old multiple award-winning musician and businessman, whose real name, by the way, is Dapo Daniel Oyebanjo, is not the only one to have been dissuaded from pursuing the arts. This is an all-too-familiar story for many of Africa's brightest entertainers. You only have one life to live. If you're lucky, then you might get two. I was down so down to the hit. Was a miracle that got me through. Jibanja's father had actually wanted him to follow in his steps to become a military man, but his love for music was too strong. And today, his father's concerns for his so-called career go beyond Dibanja's ability to handle the fame that comes with show business. Dibanj says in the interview that his father told him, quote, when I was your age, I was married and I already had you. When are you going to settle down? Oh well, Dibanj says a Grammy in his trophy chest is his primary concern, but might just be distracted should an angel pass his way. Anyway, our headlines again. Scores of angry parents whose children attend the University of Ghana Basic School accused Vice Chancellor of the University of Acts of lawlessness after they were prevented from entering the school. Financial leakages in the public sector 
set to cost Ghana some 1 to 2 billion Ghana cities annually. Find more news on mindjawonline.com. Thank you very much for staying through the year. Have a great week. My name is Kemini Yamani Amana. Goodbye.